I think the biggest question we've got from people interested in INES or the fund is that they want to see more detail of what's actually in the portfolio and what actually you're investing in. So that's exactly what this is designed to do today. I'm going to give you plenty of detail about the stocks in the portfolio, the process behind them, uh, explain what some of the risks to the portfolio or how we're managing the risks. And also I want to talk about the expected returns in the portfolio. I know the PDS doesn't give you a lot of information. It just says that we want to outperform after fees. But what I, the main point I guess I want to say today, aside from providing detail of the stocks in the fund, is that we have absolutely no intention of underperforming just because we're running an ethical fund. And in fact, the biggest advantage we've got is our size. Because we're not managing billions of dollars, uh, we can mix up uh, the size of the stocks we own. And as I'll talk about uh, coming up, the average market cap of the stocks in the portfolio at the moment is five and a half billion dollars. So this is not a small cap uh, portfolio, although a couple of the opportunities are smaller businesses that I'm going to talk about today. And our absolute biggest advantage we have as a fund is that we're fairly small in the sense that we're not managing hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And so when we find these smaller businesses, and I'll just use an example of Ordinate, which we'll talk about, this is a small company today, but it's one that we think can become much, much bigger over time. And because we've got that flexibility to invest in different size businesses, it means as this small business grows, or at least we think it's going to grow over time, all we have to do is hang on to it. And that's a very tax effective way of investing. And if, if we bought right, then it means there'll be fairly minimal turnover in the portfolio as well. But that's getting far too much into the details. So let's move along. So I'll just put the disclaimer there. Uh, if you've got one more time, you can always come and download the slides. So the first slide is, why am I personally invested in the fund? Well, first of all, because it's investing in tomorrow's champions and not in yesterday's heroes, uh, like the, uh, I guess, the banks and the iron ore type companies. These are companies that people have owned a lot of for a very long time, but they're very, very large companies now. And as exceptional as some of the iron ore companies might be for a resources company, uh, they're not the type of businesses that I prefer to own. What we really want to own is good companies that have control over their pricing and are far more predictable and not reliant on a wide range of prices for their, their chief products through the, the full cycle. As I just talked about, our biggest advantage is that we're not anchored by size. So we've got a really nice mix of stocks that should make you feel very comfortable about potentially investing in the fund. It's not a small cap fund, although I'm going to focus on a couple of the smaller ideas just because they're the ones I'm most excited about. Uh, there's big opportunities overseas for a number of businesses in Australia. We always used to talk about companies making transform transformational acquisitions abroad and being very worried about companies using debt and potentially blowing up the business. Uh, a smaller example of that would be West Farmers and trying to buy a Bunnings-like company in the UK recently, and that was almost over within the blink of an eye. Uh, money was blown up and they sold the business and come back to Australia wishing they'd never done it. So what we're really seeing in the new types of companies, particularly in software type businesses, is that they're actually able to expand organically overseas because they've got a wonderful product. And that's a very, very different game to acquiring using lots of debt abroad. But we're also seeing a few companies make acquisitions overseas as well, which we think make a lot of sense. As always with our process, and you'll just get absolutely sick of me talking about this, but we're backing founders with skin in the game. We talk about ethical funds or ESG funds, so that's environmental concerns, social considerations and governance. And for me, there's no governance like having a founder at the helm of the business with his own reputation on the line for his customers and other stakeholders like shareholders. We have everything we need to materially outperform over time and I'll talk more about this in a moment, but really our size is our biggest advantage. There is lots and lots of research that show uh, small cap managers outperform, but at some point in time, every successful fund manager needs to decide whether they want to maximise their returns for clients or whether they want to maximise the money in their own pocket. And we're never going to be turning this fund into a multi-billion dollar portfolio. We want to ma maximise the returns. And that's why we've got this great advantage of starting out quite small, which means we can have a really nice mix of nice, safe, blue chip businesses, which we know inside and out. And we can add the more interesting, smaller stocks uh, to those uh, that portfolio over time. And, and I'll talk plenty about uh, the different companies we've got in the portfolio as we go along. Interestingly, there's a, although this is a growth fund, it's got a, uh, we estimate a 3% forecast dividend yield. Grossed up, that would be 4% on our current estimate. 
So it just goes to show you in Australia, we are actually very lucky. We do have very high dividend paying companies, even in a growth fund. That's not something you generally see overseas. Uh, and just to preempt potential questions about what will change under Labor's dividend policies, well, actually nothing will change for us. Uh, maybe perhaps we'll see some stocks uh, get more attention because uh, if this is assuming that you, you can't get uh, franking credits uh, on, if you're on a zero or low tax rate, but companies in the portfolio like Sydney Airport and Unibail, Redamco, Westfield, they don't pay fully frank di uh, distributions, they're unfranked. And so if there's some sort of trend towards these stocks, uh, even though I'd say that uh, people are already very familiar with these businesses, um, then maybe that portfolio will benefit from that. And the last point there is what returns can you expect from the fund? As I said, the PDS just says we're going to beat the index over time and we've got a long history of doing that. But for me, running a fund of the anticipated size of this ethical fund and the, really the biggest advantage is, as I keep saying, we're not managing hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, is that I don't see any reason why we can't produce a return of 2 to 4% uh, after fees over the index through a full cycle. When you go through a downturn, this is when a portfolio like this will really, really be able to take advantage of it because size isn't such an issue. We don't have to restrict ourselves to yesterday's heroes and old blue chips that aren't growing very quickly or are very highly priced in the current market. We can really get behind some of our best ideas and if we can hold them for five to 10 years, like some of the stocks I'm gonna talk about shortly, then we expect to absolutely materially outperform over time and this is the main reason that I'm invested. So I thought I'd just go quickly, I didn't explain this very well in our original webinar, but just in terms of what stocks are in and out or, or available to invest in in the fund, we use what we call a negative screen or just really a screen to screen out what are widely agreed uh, industries or companies uh, in certain industries that are widely agreed to be unethical or to have high risk uh, regarding environmental, social or governance factors. In Australia, what this really means is it knocks out fossil fuel companies, so resources companies, payday lenders, alcohol and gambling companies. We've got a few junk food and beverage companies as well. And supply chain concerns knocks out one company of, uh, I can think of uh, in, in fashion uh, and armaments, but we don't have very many of those listed in Australia. So that's what it, it, uh, it knocks out. And people are thinking, well, if it knocks out all those companies, then surely there's not that much else to invest in and your returns are going to be poor. But um, this presentation is all about arguing otherwise. Just in terms of our approach, the intelligent investor approach has been going for nearly 20 years and we don't expect it to change much. Uh, and this quote really sums it up from Jesse Livermore, who was a guy that actually uh, made and lost about three fortunes before committing suicide, but he's, there's a book about him called uh, Reminis Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, which talks about his process back in the 30s. But he just had this quote, which neatly sums up our process, which is, it was never my thinking that made the big money for me. It was always my sitting. And the best thing I can do as the portfolio manager is to buy right the first time and then just stay out of the way and hang on as the business compounds your money at high rates of return. I just thought I'd provide a little bit of detail about uh, our investment process. Again, this high insider ownership is definitely the type of business we're looking for. If you go through the research, uh, and I'll show you some charts shortly, but it's still, even in today's age of all this information, one of the most reliable indicators of outperformance over time is having a high insider ownership or the founder running the business. And that's because they think long-term about their businesses. They spend plenty of money investing in the business to entrench their competitive advantages over time. And if you compare that to someone, and I always pick on Mike Smith at ANZ, but came in, said, we're gonna to go to Asia. Everybody got very excited. Unfortunately, ANZ is not one quarter of a regulated oligopoly in Asia, and that process has been reversed. And the only person who got rich was Mike Smith, who bought his $40 million home on the Victorian coast. And the worst thing is now the incoming CEO he has his options mark at the low price uh, while the earnings are suffering because of the Asian expansion. And then what happens is he gets the business back to where it normally should be before Mike Smith's Asian strategy came along. And then you have to pay out on those options. So it's almost like a, a double dig from two separate CEOs because of one bad mistake supported by the board and, and a misguided strategy. So I've just named uh, a number of ASX codes there of, of stocks that are in the portfolio that have high insider ownership. 
So you can see there's, I think, 11 stocks there I've named. So this is a really, really important theme for our portfolio. We want companies with long growth runways. And the reason we want that is because technology is eroding competitive barriers like never before. And so we will always want to make sure we're on the right side of technology. And if preferable, uh, although we have to be a bit pragmatic in a market like this, we want a large discount to intrinsic value. But more important to a large discount to intrinsic value is we, we want to buy quality. But one stock that I think is particularly cheap on a more statistical basis at the moment is Clydesdale Bank. And I'll talk about that after. The other group of situations we call special situations, uh, these are opportunities for value investors to come in often when other investors have given up on a stock, they've lost money, uh, maybe the company's been very poorly run, the balance sheet is in bad shape and investors don't care what, about the valuation of the future, they just want out. And one of those is a company uh, which is Blackmore's whose share price is down about 55%. And finally, we think it makes sense on a valuation perspective, but it's a uh, company is currently looking for a new CEO. Uh, and again, I'll talk about it shortly. Busted IPOs can be very fruitful, recapitalizations, although we don't have any in the portfolio at the moment. And spin-offs are still uh, almost like the insider ownership, a very reliable indicator of outperformance over time. And we've seen four spin-offs uh, recently have, uh, well, I've just mentioned four stocks there that have either been recommendations of intelligent investor or in our other funds. So we had Dulux uh, in our portfolio, but that's taken out. Uh, Trade Me, TPG Telecom is under a cloud, but uh, potentially a deal with Vodafone. And South32 was an old spin-off, uh, it was an old recommendation of ours from BHP. So this is a, quite an American theme, but it's becoming more common in Australia. We're also seeing that we're having more momentum and more artificial intelligence being used. Uh, with managed funds. And so what we need to do in order to uh, compete with them is to find opportunities that a robot or an algorithm can't do the analysis on. And a couple of the good examples are 360 Capital and Frontier Digital Ventures, which I'm going to talk about in detail very shortly. So this is a chart showing uh, the S&P 500 uh, back to 2008, it runs to about 2018. And this shows the returns for uh, every spin-off over that decade. And it's been very well known for a long time that spin-offs produce outsized returns. Uh, but even in the modern day age, even though it's well known, it's, it still continues to do that. And so you can just see on the right hand side, I've talked about a few spin-offs there. There was South 32 from BHP. We saw Coles getting spun off from West Farmers. And we may see the wealth management businesses spun off from the banks at some point soon or, or a bit later on. So whenever we see a spin-off, we get very interested because uh, the best ones are where a smaller part of a, a larger business gets spun off and management finally has its own incentives. It has the money it needs to finally make the investments it's wanted to need, whereas before it was a part of a larger conglomerate and used to have to compete against other chief executives within the business for money. And it's amazing what can happen over time. You don't need to know the detail of this chart, but on the left-hand side, this looks at the performance of founder-led companies uh, for the S&P 500, so the major index in the US, going back to 1990. Now, really important with this chart is it only goes up to 2014, and you can see the absolute crazy outperformance of founder-led companies compared to all the rest in that period. Now, I'd love to have this chart from 2014 to 2019, because imagine what it would look like if all the major US technology companies, such as Amazon, Google, Apple, Netflix, which all have founder-led businesses, if it had those returns for the last four or five years, given that they've been really pulling the US market along, then this chart would look absolutely insane. So again, even in a modern technological world where everybody's got lots of information, there are still these reliable indicators of outperformance, and we want to absolutely make the most of that. On the right hand side there, again, you don't have to know the detail of the chart, but what it's telling you is it's not just technology companies uh, that have founder led companies that outperform, but it's across all industries. There's just something away about companies that have found, founders in charge that think much longer term about the business and they aren't these corporate CEOs just coming in for four or five years thinking nothing more than about how they're gonna maximize their bonus in the case of heads they win and tails shareholders lose. There's just uh, a nice theme that's been talked about 
uh, by a guy called Mark Andreessen for, uh, well, he started as an article in 2011 where I provided the link. It's, it's not very long, so um, please do go and have a look. It's an interesting little read. Uh, at least it shows how right he's been. Mark Andreessen has been one of the most successful technology investors in the world, and he came up with this line that software is eating the world. And it's explained nicely by the Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, and he said, every place, whether it's our homes, our offices, factories, stadiums, every industry from oil and gas to retail to agriculture to financial services, everything from connected cars to connected refrigerators to smart surgical tools to smart copy machines are all being driven by software. And we are very lucky in Australia that we have a number of great software businesses. And most people are familiar with the WAX companies, which includes WiseTech and Altium. But these businesses at the moment trade on extremely high valuations where I think the returns are going to be extremely poor over the next five years if you're paying current prices for that group of stocks. But there are some other businesses that we think have, haven't really been discovered by the market yet. So we're really trying to focus on what the next generation of software companies is in Australia that can potentially go global and become uh, what Peter Lynch would refer to as multi-baggers or stocks that go up multiple folds over time. So this first company I'm going to talk about isn't necessarily a software company. It's called 360 Capital. But what it's doing at the moment is it's trying to transform or is transforming from a B-grade property REIT, so a property investor, into more of a property fund manager like Charter Hall. And this is the stock price chart that goes back to 2009. The ASX ticker for the company is called TGP. And it was originally called Trafalgar. And I had a personal investment uh, down at the bottom there in 2009 for the next couple of years because a guy called Tony Pitt came in, took a large stake in the business. And you might remember going back to the GFC that all the REITs were trading at large discounts to the net tangible assets. And he said, I'm going to come in, fix up this portfolio, increase the occupancy, get the rents up, and then I'm going to sell off each individual property and I'm going to close that gap with the net tangible assets. And that's exactly what he did. And I thought I was pretty clever. I made my 70% over 18 months, two years, and I got out and moved on to what I thought was the next great investment. What you can see as you look more towards 2013 was around the time that I think when Becton went broke, and uh, which was a Victor major Victorian property developer, and he bought the funds management business in. And you can see the extraordinary performance of the stock since. So I was the stupid one that didn't stick with the, with the stock. But what he's done is Tony has really ridden the recovery in property prices extraordinarily well. But now he's changing where the business at the moment is just about all cash. And recently he's announced news of uh, four new funds uh, with capital to be raised. So there were three uh, specific property slash credit type funds, each with around $25 million to be raised. So 75 million in total. And just last week, announced another $250 million fund to be raised, which was a joint venture with another party. And just uh, by the sake of limited time today, I won't go through the details, but at the moment, the stock is trading at net tangible assets. So you're paying absolutely zero for the funds that are going to be managed shortly by this business. And if over the next five years, the company can be managed billion dollars or more, then essentially you're getting all that value for free. So even at this late stage of the market, there is still value to be found in high growth companies. And this is one of the, the top holdings in the fund. One of the reasons why is in a, uh, 360 Capital is in a great spot at the moment. Again, don't focus too much on the details of this bit, very busy slide, but the banks are actually pulling out of doing small developments. So think of a, a, like a doctor's office that needs to be built in the suburbs. It's around $30 million, it's small. It's not gonna move the needle for the big banks and they've got no interest on taking any more development risk. Well, that's absolutely a, a perfect project for 360 Capital. It's the right size, it's small, the payback period's very short, 12 to 18 months. And at the moment, the returns are probably around 30% higher than what they ordinarily would be because there's very little competition for providing funds to these fairly safe and short dated developments. So it's a real niche that this company is in at the moment and it's the perfect time to be raising funds because there are all sorts of investors, particularly high net wealth, uh, net worth investors that are looking to take advantage of the much higher returns in the sector while the banks are competing uh, for funds. 
And this last slide, again, we won't go into detail today, but this is just the software platform that uh, 360 Capital uses to match up potential investors into its funds and into potential projects. And again, this is a, an excellent example of a situation that a robot or some sort of software can't actually go and pick up. It, it's You can't go through the earnings, you can't see rapid earnings growth, the value in the business is still yet to hit the balance sheet or the income statement, but the idea that we're paying for potentially around $300 million of funds under, uh, sorry, we're not paying anything for around $300 million of uh, potential money under management very shortly and potentially billions over the next five to 10 years. Uh, to me, this um, almost seems like a no brainer, which is not to say that there's no risk, uh, but if we can find 20 ideas like this, we know we're gonna do exceptionally well over time. This next company is Audinate. It is a, an audio company where if you think of the speakers in your homes and all the cords that generally have to be plugged in, well, what Audinate has done is it makes these little microchips which go into the speaker and then it has software uh, called Dante that picks up the signals or the re uh, receives the signals from uh, whatever speakers or equipment you've got in the home or whether it's a big auditorium. And then with the software, you can uh, manage the, the audio equipment. So this is doing something that you would have thought was probably should have been done ages ago. But what's the real competitive advantage for Audinate is that it has to be part of the design process for companies like Yamaha, who design speakers and all sorts of other audio equipment. And once they've got their uh, microchip or transponder into their equipment, then it's very hard for another company to come in and develop new products with uh, to put their chip in. And I'm gonna show you a chart at the moment that shows Ordinate is absolutely killing the competition at the moment. Just a few statistics there. The market cap is still under $400 million. The market size it's chasing is $400 million for audio. It's now launched stereo equipment. So there's another $400 million market there. And then for the software, it's another $200 million market. So it's a very large market for a company of this size for a business that we believe will be exceptionally pro profitable over the next five to 10 years. Current sales are only $30 million. So that's a, a 10 or 12 times revenue. But we think this business is, uh, this business is going to grow into that valuation over time. And the reason that is, uh, we believe that is because five times, uh, Audinate, in terms of the products out there in the market with a microchip fitted, that can pick up signals. Audinate has uh, the number of products with an Audinate microchip is five times higher than its next largest competitor. And the competition has effectively just given up on trying to compete. Again, we've got 8% insider ownership, which is really important to us. And at the moment, there's only one broker covering the stock. Uh, so that's an absolutely perfect situation for us. Find these companies early, hold them for a long time as the rest of the market catches on and let the high compounding of earnings over time work for you in a very tax efficient manner. This slide shows you how far ahead of the competition Audinate is. You can see the number of uh, products. This is just taken straight out of uh, the company's uh, latest, uh, or one of their slide decks. And you can see the next closest competitor is Cobranet. And, um, there's a, I did an interview with the CEO recently on uh, the InvestMart website, which you can check that out. And you can see that revenue for Cobranet hasn't grown in the last five or six years. So the competitive advantage of Dante or Ordinate over its competitors is only increasing. And that's why we're so confident this company can grow into its valuation. This will be a key holding for the portfolio over a long time. Again, this just shows you uh, the sort of equipment it makes. Uh, again, it's just audio equipment and it's just designed to remove the cables. So it's a very useful product and you can see some of the brands it's associated with. These are the most well-known brands in audio equipment, Yamaha, Bose, Bosch, and the list goes on. But this is a business that's only almost at innings one or two of its journey. And there's a long, long way to go and we expect to be there for the whole way. Again, this just shows you again, the growth in the number of products uh, with the Dante um, enabled software using them. So this is a stock that I've owned personally since it IPO'd about two years ago. And finally, we got the uh, results from the company that we've uh, been waiting for. And this is another one of the key holdings in the fund. This company is called Frontier Digital Ventures. The CEO and founder of the business is a guy called Sean DiGregorio. He's ex-REA Property Group. 
And then he moved on to iProperty Group, which you may remember got sold back to REA Group. And when he went to iProperty, it was uh, had a lot of uh, businesses in Southeast Asia and it was doing extremely poorly. And if you go back and can find a chart of the share price, uh, which you can actually see in uh, the latest Frontier Digital Ventures slide deck, uh, basically the share price just went into the stratosphere after Sean went in and fixed the business up and got the operating results of what should be expected by an online classifieds business that's the leader in its market. And so he's basically taken his uh, the amount of money he made from that personally and put it all into Frontier. And what Frontier owns is stakes or investments in 15 online classifieds businesses in rapidly growing markets. And by far and away, the biggest asset is the mean, which is the Pakistan version of REA Group. And I can imagine what you're thinking, why would I want to be invested in Pakistan? And if you're like me, you remember when you used to see 60 Minutes when you were a young kid, the only time you saw Pakistan in the news was when there was an uprising uh, or there was war on the border with India. But do yourself a favour, go to the Zameen website, check out the apartment developments, and you'll see apartment developments that look absolutely the same as what they would in Melbourne or, or any of other uh, Australia's big cities. And this is a population of nearly 200 million people which are just starting uh, only in its infancy as far as going online and buying property. In this last uh, quarter, revenue was growing at 100% and it produced its first quarter of break even at the operating profit level. And where history has been concerned with companies like REA Group and car sales, once these companies hit uh, break even and they no longer require any more capital, usually that's your last chance to buy the stock uh, at a discount. And at the moment, we believe that Frontier actually trades for less than what its 30% stake in Zameen is worth. So effectively, you're getting all the other 14 investments for nothing. And again, you've got huge insider ownership here. Here's just a couple of facts and figures on Pakistan. So nearly 200 million people uh, with only 40% urbanisation, uh, which is quite a change uh, compared to Australia. Only around 20%, uh, 22% of people are using the internet and you can see the mobile unit users there's 109 uh, million people um, using mobile phones so you can see the growth already of what's naturally going to be there over the next decade but better than that there's actually a very um, I don't know how big the population is but there's plenty of uh, wealthy individuals in Pakistan but there's also a very large expat community living in places like London so uh, people tend to worry or what if the Pakistan Rupiah falls, does that going to decrease the value of the business? Well, actually what happens is the expats living in places like London who are earning pounds actually then go and buy more property in Pakistan. So this is a business that we think can be worth much, much more uh, many times over over the next five to 10 years. Currently it's only valued at 300 million Australian dollars and I expect those valuations will be going up after the latest quarter. And compare that to REA Group in Australia, which is uh, currently valued at around $10.5 billion. This is a country with 10 times as many people. Now, obviously, on a per capita basis, they're nowhere near as rich as what Australia is, uh, but a $300 million, million valuation for this business just uh, screams extraordinarily low for us. So now a company you'll be a little bit more familiar with, it's Blackmores. Uh, so this is the vitamins and supplements company, and the share price is around $90 at the moment and it's come down from $220, which I would argue, and in fact, Marcus Blackmore, the founder's son and uh, current CEO and largest shareholder, argue that it shouldn't have got to in a inter recent interview either. So what's gone wrong at Blackmore's recently? Well, the costs are far too high. The margins are operating profit margins are only around 15% at the moment, and that compares to Swiss at around 30%. And the peak of Blackmore's margins were a couple of years ago, and they were around 26%. And so I think the business can definitely get into the 20s. And so on a current price to earnings multiple, the uh, for Blackmore's is around 22. So if you just put it back on that margin, all of a sudden you get to back to around somewhere around 15 or 16 times earnings, which for a business with only a 2% Chinese market share and working in countries where the adoption of vitamins and supplements is still very low, uh, I'll show you a chart in a moment, uh, I think this is a, a potentially great opportunity for a business that has uh, entrenched competitive advantages and is really a marketing machine and all of its current problems have been self-inflicted. 
Again, you can see their insider ownership there, very large at 22%. And there's a number of interviews, and one that we've done recently uh, with Marcus Blackmore, who's the interim CEO, and he tells you exactly what's gone wrong with the business and doesn't put the foot of blame anywhere else except besides internally at the business. And that's exactly what you want or what you expect from a founder CEO. Very straight talking, lays out the problems, and he's coming up with a plan to fix them. That's the benefit of having founders in charge. And also the bonus for what I think is still going to be a fast growing company is you get a 3.3% dividend yield. This chart just shows you on a per capita basis how underdone Chinese people are for their vitamin dietary supplement usage. This just compares to Asia, uh, but if you compare this to other places in the West, it, it just looks smaller again. So Blackmores has a wonderful brand name in China and the mistake that it's made recently is that it essentially decided to go, to go it alone in China rather than use the Daigus, which are people generally in Australia that buy a, a whole heap of Blackmores products and then go back to China and sell it for a premium. And what uh, Marcus Blackmore talks about is that we took that channel for granted because, excuse me, uh, they were, the Daigus were actually doing the marketing for them. So in a sense, they weren't even paying for that. And so that's been a real mistake made internally. And the other problem is that, that we haven't been, or Blackmores hasn't been giving the Daigus enough new products. And that's actually an internal problem. That's not because those products haven't been talked about. Uh, it's just uh, they haven't been a priority for the existing management and now the CEO has exited and we're waiting for a new one to be appointed. So all of these problems Blackmore's faces are actually self-inflicted and once they can correct those problems over the next two or three years, then we think today's price will look undervalued. Got this slide here which just shows you from the US perspective the difference or the gap between valuations of what are widely considered to be value stocks versus growth stocks. And incredibly, the gap is actually now slightly wider than it was in 1999 during the tech boom. So people are saying, and we're seeing these same headlines that we see every decade or so, is that value investing doesn't work anymore. And that's just simply not true. And if you look at a few takeovers recently, uh, interesting as three ethical versus one non-ethical, but Dulux was in this ethical portfolio and, until it got taken over. And Trade Me and TPG Telecom and Crown uh, stocks in our other portfolios or been previous recommendations at Intel's an investor have all received takeover bids, which shows you there is value in the market. The market's just disinterested in these types of stocks at the moment. So uh, we don't have any of uh, those companies in the ethical portfolio, but it just shows you value investing still works. And so in addition to uh, 360 Capital, which to us looks very silly valued, considering there's not one cent you're paying in the share price for a funds management business that's about to potentially have hundreds of millions of dollars in it. And there's still plenty of value out there. As long as we put our biggest advantage to work, which is being able to find the smaller high growth businesses uh, before anyone else and then hang on to them for the next decade. This company is one that's probably fairly well known in Australia, but maybe they don't know the details of the actual bank itself, but Clydesdale Bank. Again, another spin-off. This was spun off by National Australia Bank two or three years ago. And recently, the share price has been hammered for a couple of different reasons. One, the US UK economy is actually doing okay, given um, how painful Brexit, Brexit has been. But it's um, it was certainly not going gangbusters. And the other major issue is that Clydesdale Bank had acquired Virgin Money UK. And in terms of uh, lower interest rates in the country, there's been an impact on the profits from that business. And so the stock price has dropped um, from over $6 Australian a share to around $3.50. It was recently up as around four, but it's dropped back again recently. But this is a bank which has excellent management. They're absolutely renowned for their cost cutting, which is exactly what you need to do in the bank to keep your margins high, particularly in a low interest rate environment. At the moment, the stock trades at just 0.7 times book value. So that's about half the valuation of Commonwealth Bank. And remember, the UK banks have had their comeuppance in the property market, so they are battle tested through a genuine property downturn in a way that the Australian banks haven't been. Its, it's uh, balance sheet is in excellent shape and has surplus capital, and we expect dividends to increase dramatically over the next few years. And next month, the company uh, has its three-year uh, has its strategy day and lays out its strategy for the next three years, and we'll get a more firmer 
uh, or more specific amount of what we expect those dividends to be. So we think this is an exceptionally cheap business. We expect high capital gains over the next three or four years and high dividends as well. So these are the top 10 holdings we expect for, uh, in the fund when we launch. At the moment, uh, in terms of portfolio limits, they, they range around 3 to 4% each. So Frontier, uh, 360 Capital and Ordinate, uh, I've talked about. Unibail or Redamco Westfield is the large European property trust, and that's currently offering a 7% distribution yield and trading at an absolutely enormous discount uh, to net tangible assets. So not what I'll consider necessarily a high growth business, uh, but because of the undervaluation and the returns we expect, uh, in a sense, it's going to produce growth like returns. And the other companies I expect you'll be mostly familiar with, Ramsey Healthcare, which has had very slow earnings growth recently, but things are looking much better in France and the UK now. Car Sales and Seek, which are the online car and jobs classified as businesses uh, in Australia. Link Services uh, is a little bit like Computer Share, uh, but a very global business uh, helping uh, with funds administration. Zero is a, a software company which, uh, if it succeeds in, US, in the US over the next decade, is going to be a much, much bigger business than it is today. And its uh, reported profits are fairly minimal at the moment, but that should change over the next few years. And I've talked about Blackmores as well. So while I've talked about some of the smaller companies in the portfolio, it's just because they're the ones I'm most genuinely excited about. But in terms of the portfolio, there's some wonderful blue chip names, some absolutely excellent first class Australian businesses with large overseas earnings, which is another really important perspective on the portfolio. And you can see the average market cap there of five and a half billion dollars. So this is not a small cap fund. You should feel very confident about investing in a portfolio if this is the sort of portfolio you're interested in and suits your own risk um, return hurdles. Uh, this isn't a small cap portfolio. There's some absolutely some of Australia's cream of the crop businesses in there. And we expect they're going to be wonderful investments, uh, particularly as their overseas businesses grow over the next decade. You can see I personally put this slide together. It's, it's the poorest one looking one of the lot. But I did an exercise just last night and went through each stock in the portfolio and dug out what I expect their Australian revenue to look like versus how much is overseas revenue and you can see um, at the moment, this 41% of the revenue earned by this business it comes from overseas. And I think this is really, really important at the moment because one, most Australians are very overinvested in Australia and very under diversified. So this is a very easy way to get some international diversification without any complexity uh, in a simple Australian uh, stock that you can um, invest in through INES. Now, interestingly, there's a number of companies that actually uh, potentially could have higher profits if the Australian dollar was to fall, uh, but they earn their money in Australia, and so they're not actually included in that 41%. But if you think of Sydney Airport, we should get more overseas visitors if the Australian dollar falls. Platinum Asset Management is an overseas fund manager, which is on the nose at the moment, and they usually do very well uh, when markets uh, have panic attacks. That's usually when their short book pays off, but again, it's an uh, it invest overseas. Pinnacle, again, has a little bit of overseas exposure through one of its funds. And OFX is the online currency conversion company, which offers rates that uh, are only tiny compared to getting ripped off at the major banks. Uh, I think they're only about 10 or 15% of the cost compared to transacting foreign currency to major bank. And it's got a really nice growing business at the moment with small and medium sized businesses that need to transact foreign currency on a regular basis. And again, uh, when currencies are volatile, you would expect OFX to be doing more transactions. So in actual fact, the, um, if it was a low Aussie dollar you were thinking about, it actually the overseas revenue in a sense is higher than that 41%. But the main reason we own these businesses is because they are first rate high quality businesses and they're generally the number one or two in their industries. And that's how we, we mostly control risk by investing in safe businesses with clear growth paths uh, paths, excellent balance sheets, and preferably with the founders running the business. So we, we don't generally talk about risk in a presentation like this. We're trying to show you what we expect from these businesses and why we expect they're going to do well. But when we're sitting in our office, the absolute number one we're thinking about all the time is how can we possibly lose money and how can we put a portfolio together that will take us through whatever economic, economic environment we get from here, but also can make high returns over time and beat the index. 
So just in terms of uh, the stock, uh, obviously it's open to invest at the moment and you can avoid any brokerage costs. Uh, but once it's listed, you can buy and sell it just like any regular stock. You can see it's a ready-made portfolio. So we'll do the hard investing work. And I've named uh, nearly every stock on at least one of these slides. It's going to be in the portfolio. I talked about the same intelligent investor long-term approach that we've used for a long time. All we're doing now is, is adding an explicit uh, ESG risk framework but if you think about it we're always thinking about uh, large risks to businesses anyway and this is why I think the ethical approach uh, or framework is really just an addition to what we're already doing which is why we think we, it works very well with our investing approach. Uh, societal changes um, will change over time and will evolve with them but things like governance and looking at management and stuff that were already really really important to us and have been for the last nearly 20 years. So really what this uh, ESG or ethical framework is doing is just doubling down on those risk factors and making sure that we're staying uh, well away from any business that has high environmental, social or governance risk. We're focusing on high quality businesses as always. That's just part of our approach anyway. Uh, we know, you know as far back as listening to Warren Buffett and all the other old books we've read from Peter Lynch that over the last 40 and 50 years, that buying quality works over time. The, the hardest part is just hanging on. Uh, Long-term holdings to help minimise your tax, semi-annual distributions, and talked about the starting likely 3% dividend yield and 4% grossed up. And you'll get the same regular reporting and candid communication that you know us for. And there's a management fee of 0.97% and absolutely no performance fee. So the management expense ratio, which is widely quoted for a lot of funds, uh, is usually around one and a half to two percent and ours is less than one percent and that's not going to change. Unfortunately that's a photo of me that I'm going to have to look at for a few minutes but we'll take any questions you've got uh, with the time we've got left. Um, okay so we just have one I know that you touched on it briefly but how will Labor's policy affect the ethical fund? So for growth stocks I don't think it's going to matter too much the fundamentals of the business as themselves is going to matter much more um, than any change to franking credits. There will obviously be um, some other industries impacted by environmental uh, policies that Labor may or, or may not roll out, but they generally don't have an impact on the sorts of companies we own. Uh, any companies that have those sorts of issues are generally very capital intensive businesses that rely on tax subsidies and we don't really want those sort of businesses. We want to own companies that can uh, have their set their own destiny. In terms of the dividends, uh, there's a couple of stocks in there that don't pay fully frank dividend yields or distributions. And so that's Unibail, Redamco, Westfield, and also Sydney Airport. And I think maybe that's why we've seen the share price of Sydney Airport just go up a little bit recently because it actually had a result recently which showed for the first time, I think, passenger numbers went slightly backwards, which is no big deal in the long term of the scheme of things, but you would expect the share price to be um, either falling a little bit or at least just standing still. And yet we've seen the share price go up around 10%. And I think that's because people are already starting to make their moves into companies that now look more attractive because they don't have to consider franking credits anymore. But what I would say is it's still a long way from any franking credit implementation by Labor. First, they've got to get voted in. And then second, they've got to get uh, the decisions through the parliament. And there's some expectation that uh, the Labor's policy as it currently stands will actually be watered down and there may actually be some sort of limit to get it through. So maybe if you're not, um, if you're not collecting more than say $10,000 in franking credits per year or something like that, then, then the policy won't apply. So I don't think there's any reason to rush out and change anything yet. Just, you've got plenty of time, just wait and see what happens. But I don't think the, the only impact I can think about our potential, our fund, is it will be slightly positive, if anything.